I'm Tanya Muntz, the President and CEO of the Forest History Society. And I'd like to welcome all of you with us today. We have about 100 people virtual and many of you in person, and it's just wonderful to have you here. So thank you so much for coming out to the 2023 Lynn W. Day Distinguished Lecture on Forest and Conservation History. Tonight, we are delighted to have with us Terry Baker. Terry is the Chief Executive Officer of the Society of American Foresters, the nation's largest professional organization for foresters. Before being appointed CEO in 2018, Terry served in the USDA Forest Service in a variety of positions on several different national forests for 20 years. He earned his master's degree in forest management and policy from Yale University and a bachelor's degree in forest resources and conservation at the University of Florida, as well as a bachelor's degree in agricultural sciences from Florida A&M University. His talk today is entitled Forest Fanatics, How Do We Align Around Today's Forest Climate Issues, which is a terrific title. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Terry Baker. Uh, all right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to share some of my thoughts. Ooh, all right. Where do I need to move? I will stand over here for now. Um, around topics that are near and dear to my heart, around the concepts and the issues that we face and the attention that are on our forests right now, especially in relation to a wide variety of climate challenges and issues that we're trying to address. Um, so excited to jump into this. Uh, for those of you who know me, I, I enjoy to tie my points, enjoy tying my points to, to some of the stories and experiences I've had. We'll jump right into it. I'll, I'll give a little bit of a history, uh, a little bit of information about myself and about the Society of American Forces for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, and then we'll, we'll jump into some, some topics and discussion. Um, but what I will say is, I know there's some folks in the crowd, hopefully you're not expecting me to solve all the forest climate issues tonight for you. Um, but what I do hope that I will share with you is that there are a variety of perspectives and thoughts on things and how do we approach those conversations so we can be successful no matter what the topic that comes before us. All right, let's see. All right, SAF, um, we were established in 1900. Our mission is quite the mission. Um, to advance sustainable management of forest resources through science, education, and technology, promoting professional excellence while ensuring the continued health, integrity, and use of forests to benefit society in perpetuity. Say that three times fast. So this was an interesting part. So Jamie asked me to come up with a catchy title. And I was like, I'm drawing a blank. He's like, I need something that's gonna draw people in. So I'm like, all right, forest fanatics. And, um, it was interesting when I came up with that title and just how I wanted to start this whole discussion off. And one of the things that came to mind for me was, what are some of the definitions? So if you went to Webster's, it defines a fanatic as a person who is extremely enthusiastic about and devoted to some interest or activity. And forest is a dense growth of trees and underbrush covering a large tract. That's all this in Webster's. Now for comparison, here's your SAF definition of forest. That's uh, it's a little more, a little meatier, you know, we, we put a little more detail into that. Um, thankfully, SCF does not have a definition for fanatic because that would probably get us in trouble. You may be wondering why Popeye is on the screen. So I was curious, I, and, and, um, and I told some folks earlier, I would not recommend you Google fanatic on your work computer or on a school computer. A lot of interesting things come up in that search. Uh, for fanatic images. But ironically, Popeye came up and I was just like, I'm gonna put him in the presentation because why not? Um, I'm guessing he's a fanatic about spinach, but it doesn't seem that way, but we're gonna, we're gonna go with that. But um, at the core of this, many of today's issues are not new. They're framed differently, but the disagreements that have, have been going on my entire career for some folks in this room for their entire careers are grounded in the same things. And they're grounded in perceptions and perspectives and experiences about what it means to manage land, should we or shouldn't we? Um, why are we managing it to what end? Um, 
the concepts of what it visually looks like, what it feels like to some people to see trees be harvested. And I think understanding that puts us in a place of really taking that step back and saying, yes, we're talking about climate issues, we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about um, <clears throat> additionality, we're talking about mature and old growth forests, but these are, are, are framings that are, are things that have been around for a long time related to our forests and forest management and how the variety of people who are interested in forests in general have these perceptions of what it should be and what it shouldn't be and how we engage. Now, obviously, I'm a little biased. I have a forestry, actually I have a couple of forestry degrees. So I look at things from that sustainable management perspective versus someone who is purely preservation. So I'm gonna put that bias in the room before we get started. Um, the story I'm gonna tell about a particular experience and a particular project in my career at the Forest Service, I think wraps this, in, this entire dynamic uh, for the group to really think through and give us some perspectives and some lessons learned to then take into what some of the conversations are today. So that's gonna be the Goose Project. And it was a really interesting experience for me as a relatively young leader in the US Forest Service in, North, in the Northwest in Oregon, actually in the Western Cascades. And so here's a few things that kind of summarize the Goose Project and, and each one of them have their own little bit of, of relevance. And so um, at its core, it was a forest thinning project that was also coupled with um, hazardous fuels reduction, remo removal of small material in and around private homes and private lands. Um, the decision that was used within the National Environmental Policy Act was an environmental assessment. That's really important. And I'll talk about that a little later as well. Um, like I mentioned, it was adjacent to, to local communities uh, to leverage state funds. Um, then that new leader to the Forest Service in 2011, that was me. Um, and then here are just some characteristics of that area. Northern Spotted Owl Habitat, Listed Fish Habitat, National Scenic Trail, the McKenzie River Trail, National Scenic River, the uh, McKenzie River, um, oh, National Wild and Scenic River. So a lot of just significantly value-based and, and scientifically-based preservation in this area. Um, a lot of just natural beauty that people are amazed by and go to this, this part of the country um, to see these things and be wowed by what nature can really look like and be. Here are some shots of up the McKinsey. So these are your Douglas fir, these are your waterfalls, these are the reasons that people come to this part of the country to just be in awe of these natural places. The McKinsey River Trail is just over 26 miles and is internationally recognized as a, as a biking trail um, and just people fall in love with this area and what it means to them. And so stepping in as a new leader, there was this decision that literally nothing, crickets, not a big issue. Everything was fine until it wasn't. So after about six months, no, maybe four months on the job, we actually started laying out the timber sales. So paint flies and controversy starts. When people saw flags and paint go up on trees, all of a sudden we have an issue. Um, and did we have an issue? It escalated quickly. We had, um, a particular set of landowners that started an online petition, um, started reaching out to local news outlets, just created this mass of angst and fear and anger. So, so what I described to you in that a couple of slides ago about this is kind of the breakdown of the project. This was a description that went into um, the petition that was online. The Goose Project is gonna clear cut old growth forests down to the banks of the McKenzie River and kill spotted owls. And I'm new to the job, I'm like, that sounds terrible. Um, my staff came to me and they're like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna vacate the decision? Because I had that authority to say, we're gonna vacate the decision. I said, well, the first thing I'm gonna do is read the decision. And I read the decision and I'm like, we're not gonna do any of these things. So I'm not gonna vacate the decision. But the pressure was mounting, there was, um, this particular petition on moveon.org was very fascinating because it, it spread significantly. It went from national to international. There were folks signing on to the petition from Australia and from the United Arab Emirates and Spain. And um, I, I recently started, I told my boss, I'm like, I'm a strong believer in like getting out and touching base and talking with people. So I think I should really go to Australia to meet with this person and say, 
what's your concern about the McKinsey River and the Goose Project? Um, that did not fly. So, so I, I stayed grounded upriver. But, um, but there are very strong feelings wrapped around this whole dynamic. And, and so one of the more interesting emails I received one morning was, um, <clears throat> I just heard of the Goose Project, a beast that has been gestating since 2009 and is about to descend on Bethlehem. That was the intro. Um, that's quite the intro. I'll, I'll never forget, I walked out of my office and, and met with my business, my office manager who lived in the local community and that was from a local community member. And I leaned in and said, Brenda, I think I'm the antichrist. I'm like, I'm, I'm concerned about this email. And, um, and she got a good laugh out of that, but it was, it was the whole dynamic of what it meant to have this type of project and have this type of pushback. And the fact that none of us get into the field of forestry, wildlife, fisheries, to be spoken to in this way, to have our integrity questioned and why are we doing the things that we're doing? And so one of, that core, one of the core things I had to really think about as a leader was, how am I gonna get my staff through this? You know, the, the dynamic of like people who are like, I'm doing a good thing, I'm here working as a civil servant and having, you know, not so nice things said about you is something that you don't sign up for and you don't necessarily, you don't learn about in school is like, oh, someone's gonna call you names. Like there's a good chance, no matter what you do in this field. So there's a whole dynamic to understanding that. Um, the thought of so many parts of this was like, is this for me, is this a time to fight or is this time to connect? So like I mentioned, I was new in the job. I'd only been on the job for about four months. And I had a, I had a, I had a decision to make like, you know, set up public meetings, go in there and just say like, here's why everybody's wrong and here's why I'm right. It's a great way to make friends. Um, or I looked at it as here's my opportunity to meet people. So why not just meet the community? Again, would love to meet them under better circumstances, but I've got everybody's attention, so let's go. And that's what I did. There were meetings, um, public meetings held, largest public meetings they've ever had, uh, public meeting uh, engagements at different school groups, at Rotary and Lions, and it was just a chance to meet people and talk. And one of the most important things that I would tell people is that I'm not here to tell you that I'm right. I'm here because I want you to think for yourself. Because you've been given one perspective on this project. And oftentimes I would ask people, have you read the decision? And it would always be no, I hadn't read the decision. But I got this email that told me that I should be upset, so I am upset. I am righteously upset with what you're gonna to do to this place that I hold dear. Okay, well, I'll ask you to read the decision. Um, that was part of the intro with the local community, but the other piece of this is, I say the joy of being a federal employee, what I mean by that is this, your contact information as a federal employee is public knowledge. Why that is important is that if some organization does not like what you're doing, because I've, I've yet to see it happen when someone likes what you're doing, they will mobilize folks and say, here is a form letter, you should email bomb this email address. Here is a phone number, you should voicemail bomb this voicemail about our feelings on this project. Well played. But like I said, for me, it's, it's a time to connect. And I was early enough in my time there where I'm like, I got nothing but time. I don't even know what I'm not supposed to be doing yet. So guess what? Every one of you who emailed me and every one of you who called and left with a little angry voicemail, we're gonna have a conversation. That shocks people. Again, when someone wants to be righteously indignant to an extent, they wanna throw it out there and walk away. And what does that do? That dehumanizes the person on the other side. For me, I'm like, no, you're gonna to have to talk to me as a person. You don't get to leave a voicemail in the wind. You don't get to send an email to an inbox that you don't think anyone is monitoring. We're about to have a conversation. And I talk with a lot of people. Goodness, I think I responded to like over a hundred emails and who knows how many phone calls, but what came out of those conversations was something very different. I had one gentleman who was very, very upset, and he said to me that writing an you know, a decision document of an environmental assessment means the Forest Service gets to call its own pitches. That was his analogy. 
So the, 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 the dynamic of an, env uh, an environmental assessment is a finding of no significance. That means what you're gonna do is not gonna have a significant impact on the environment. He felt like that was calling your own, you're calling your own pitches. And I told him that's a great analogy. I said, I will give you a sports analogy in return. My sports analogy in return is I'm a boxer and I only throw jabs. Because a finding of no significance means you know where the line is out here and you stop short. That's the requirement. That's what a finding of no significance in a decision of an environmental assessment is, finding of no significance. A finding of, you know, the, an environmental impact statement, which was actually something that I'll speak to a little bit later, was associated with the lawsuit, is oftentimes say, well, this is a more involved public process, and this is what we should require the Forest Service to do to work with us. And I, I don't have any pictures in my slide, but, but who's seen a picture of an open pit mine, for instance? Folks have seen pictures of mines, very destructive, not very pretty to see. Who's seen a picture of, um, of a dam being installed and the fairly massive environmental degradation of that, that causes? Those are projects that are implemented with environmental impact statements. But folks wanted them to, for thinning trees. So that's an interesting perspective, especially in the Northwest, of, of expectations. Um, but like I mentioned, one of the things, the, the, the piece about the shock of entering a conversation versus a conflict is when people are upset, they want you at the same place they are. They want you angry. They want you on the attack or defensive. And for me, maybe I'm just a little strange. I own that about myself. Um, I'd walk into those conversations, like I said, I'm not here to prove that you're wrong. I just wanna to talk to you and share my perspective and you make the decision for yourself. And people got really angry with me for not being angry. <laughs> and so I was just like, I'm sorry you're so upset, <laughs> but um, I'm just here to talk to you. And eventually they come out of that angry place because you're not feeding into it with them. So the conclusion of this project is a really fascinating one. It did end up in litigation and we ended up with uh, what's referred to as a bit of a unique judge's ruling on this project. And that was also within the National Environmental Policy Act, there is a, there's a definition of significance. There's many things that define significance. Like I mentioned, that difference between what should be relatively minor action compared to putting a dam in or putting in a, a mine. Those things are significant. Cutting trees is not necessarily as significant. The judge made a unique decision to say that, well, between the impact to spotted owls and the visuals, because it's a scenic, um, scenic corridor and the public outcry and a few other things, I'm gonna lump those things together and call them significant and require you to write an environmental impact statement. FYI, you're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> That's not the way the law was written. And so it put us in a very interesting place, which was we had the moment that I think most, if not every forester in this room would have. I'm right. I, technically, I'm right. She can't do that. It's time to fight. Let's, let's fight this judge on her decision. Let's appeal it. And the Office of General Counsel said, you're not going to win this. <laughs> and he said, you weren't going to win this because this is a judge that's more concerned with being right than doing the right thing. And in that moment, I stepped back and that, that phrase stuck with me. It sticks with me today. Are you more concerned with doing, being right than doing the right thing? And so in that moment, was it worth that fight? And in totality, it wasn't because what was at risk? What was at risk is if we fought that decision and an appeals court came back and said, no, this is it that puts that decision on a broader stage and basically, basically sets the tone for this to be a decision around what is significance at a regional, if not a national level for the U.S. Forest Service. That is a gamble you don't take, especially given the scenario and the situation. Now, that whole dynamic was its own interesting challenge. We ended up going through and doing an analysis as an environmental impact statement, no issues, at the end of the day, um, implemented the project 
But there were some interesting bumps in the road here and there during that process. We did have some protests. Um, I did have a tree sitter, um, which is which is interesting to have my first tree sitter. Um, but what was what was I think what was great about it for me was when there was a protest, which is very interesting. We set up um, they set up a space. They they kind of like taped off an area like this is where the protest is going to happen. So these are all the law enforcement officers. This is where the protest gets to happen. I'm like okay. And and I saw a few Forest Service employees on their side of the tape talking to the protesters. And um, and I sat there and I looked into the crowd and I saw familiar faces from the communities that I was, you know, now living and working in. So I, I crossed the tape. And I could see through a window in the building, the law enforcement officers getting very upset with me as I crossed the tape. Um, but at the end of the day, I talked to them along the way the entire time. We're a community, the Forest Service and the members of the community, folks who live upriver, we are a community. We have to solve this together. We have to understand this together. And that's where I learned some really interesting perspectives when you take the time to not approach those conversations from a defensive posture. One thing that I learned was a particular individual said, I'm not... I, I said, I want to get to the core of your of, of your concern. So let's let's talk. Let's talk about the, to get to the core of your concern. So I said, do you have an issue with trees being cut down? No. That's shocking. Okay, good to know. Um, do you have an issue that if a tree that's cut down is is used for stream habitat because we did a lot of big stream restoration projects? Nope. I think that's great. Okay, that's good to know. Do you have a problem with a tree that's been cut down being put on a truck and taken to a mill? Yes. That's the line. The assumption that there is private benefit from a public good. I spoke to another gentleman. Like I mentioned earlier, he was fairly upset. And he's like, my tax dollars should not subsidize private companies. Okay. Just want to make sure I understand you correctly. You pay taxes. You don't feel like a portion of your taxes should go towards preparing commercial timber sales that private companies buy. Yes, yes, that is it. Okay. Do you think there are taxpayers out there who do not agree with the hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars that are spent on endangered species through the Endangered Species Act? Well, that's a moral law. I'm like, you don't get to make that call with your tax dollars. That's one of the things that I said, I'm like, I don't know if I still got a job after saying that out loud, but eh, I said it. But the most important thing about saying that was it made him think. It made him see something to an extent that he didn't want to see. And it's not that you wanna make people do things they don't wanna do, but the concept of introducing things in a way that they can be palatable and Folks can avoid the thought of like, I'm actually going to think about this. There's something there that's a little worthwhile. And now I'm curious. I'm curious about the issue. I'm also curious about myself in those moments and what that means and, and why I believe the way that I do. So there was, a, there was an interesting piece before I leave the Goose Project that I wanted to share with folks. And that is... Um, there was obviously various pieces of news coverage on this. And in one comment section, there was a, an individual that made a comment that said, I was angry about this project. I reached out to the district ranger, Terry Baker, and he told me I should read the decision and I read it. And this is nowhere near what it's being made out to be. The ranger's great. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'm like, I should go to my boss and ask for a raise. But then underneath this comment, and I actually have a copy of this printed out at home somewhere in a file, one of the initiators of the entire controversy commented. And this is by far one of my, my favorite comments and it sticks in, obviously I can give it to you verbatim, it's, it's stuck in my head for now, oof, almost 10 years. I like Terry Baker too, but, he is a Yale-educated PR specialist who has been brought in to push through this horrible goose project. 
And by the time the community is feeling the brunt of the Goose project, he will be moved to the next poorly planned Forest Service project. And then I thought to myself, I'm a mercenary district ranger. I should get a raise. <laughs> if I've got that kind of magic, this is awesome. But the reality of, of how folks hold these things dear to them and how they respond and how you in turn have to respond is so critical and so important as we think about these broader issues that we're facing now. This is, this is a microcosm. This is old growth issues. This is spotted owl habitat. This is clean water and scenic, uh, scenic riverways, um, vistas, all the things are all wrapped in this project. And this is 10 years ago. And I'm sure there was a goose project that was 20 years or 30 years old. Like this is something that is not to say that there's nothing new about it, but there's, there's a foundational piece of it that we can carry with us and how we approach it and how we move forward within this space to say, yes, our forests are important and this is what we understand about them. Let's figure out how we work together on these things versus saying that the, the line is no, because the line is not no. So some lessons learned. Someone's perception is their reality and we need to respect that because we're expecting them to respect us. Um, in several talks that I give to my members, I often tell them or share with them, one of the most important things that we can do when we're in a, in a conversation with folks who do not believe that we should be managing forests is that we should start, this con start that conversation with why forests, why forests are important to you. And I said this to some students earlier, if it was going fishing with your uncle or your father or your grandfather, if it was going hiking or camping or whatever it was that drew you into this profession, the respect, the, the value you had for the outdoors, start with that conversation. Because the reality, when, you, when we start from a technical perspective of trees per acre and basal area, and it just needs to be cut, and here's all the reasons why, that's, we're having two different conversations. Those folks are talking about values. We're talking about technical expertise. And it's not just two separate conversations. That conversation comes across as we're talking down to them. And that's insulting. And that means they've shut off and they've stopped listening to us immediately. There will be name calling. That is a very, very true thing. Um, depending on which part of the country you're in, but more than likely, there will be name calling. Um, it's not people at their best, but the ability to not be drawn into someone name calling. Um, this, this, you know, a couple of the folks that sent in some very interesting emails, called me some very interesting names, asked me how I looked at myself in the mirror in the morning. I'm like, quite happily. Um, but understanding and putting yourself in a place of, this person has no idea who I am. So why am I getting upset and why am I taking it personally? Now, this is much easier said than done when it feels like you have insult and pressure coming at you from all sides. But it is something that you can start to develop as you work in this space and understand there are strong feelings and there will always be strong feelings about what we do and in some cases what we don't do. Be willing to show where people are. Um, that's just something that's always been key to me as a person and as a profession. Um, when I've led in offices, one of the things that I was known for is almost no one could find me in my office. And that was because I was always wandering through the office. Because going to someone's office and sitting in their space in the guest chair is a completely different experience than being called to the principal's office or the boss's office for a conversation. Now, I also lured my staff in with snacks and candy. And so when they thought I wasn't there, I turned around and was like, ah, gotcha, now you gotta talk to me. Um, but it's that piece of what it means to show up in someone's space versus calling them to your space. It's a matter of respect and humility that makes a huge difference when you wanna connect with someone. Provide those undeniable connections. Like I mentioned, what are those value sets? Why did we get into forestry in the first place? Why are we actually going to manage this place? Um, Remove the doubt, be able to be, be willing to be humble and, and have humility about it. So in that particular part of the country, there was actually a great article a little while ago that spoke to the concept of, actually was a, 
it was someone that was a senior, I can't remember the, the timber company, but it was someone who was a senior person in a timber company. And there was a harvest unit that he was standing in the middle of. And he was like, when I look at this, I see jobs, I see future forests, I see a, commun a rural community that is gonna continue to survive and thrive. So waxing poetic about a harvest unit. If you've seen a harvest unit, it is not pleasing to the eye. I'm a forester and I can own a harvest unit is not pleasing to the eye. And the moment we can own that with folks that are saying, I don't like the way this looks, puts us in a completely different space because for them, it feels like we respect them. Because when we don't, again, that wall goes up and they don't see us as someone who's willing to have an honest conversation with them. I had a project in that same unit where we did a big um, river restoration project. And it was the whole nine yards. They went in and dewatered the stream. They aggraded it for like, goodness, I think a half a mile or three quarters of a mile, put rocks in, tip trees into it. So in the Northwest, they don't tip, tip cows, they tip trees. They rewatered it. And my staff member, my fish biologist came to me, he's like, everything we wanted for Deer Creek was awesome. She's like, but I don't want to take you to see it. She said, because it looks like a bomb went off in the woods. That's what she saw. That's what a lot of people see when they see a timber harvest unit. Even though we know what it'll look like in a year or three years or five years, they don't. And that whole piece of us actually being willing to own that, yeah, it's not gonna look great for a while, but it will soon after. But just that moment of saying, it's not gonna look great. Doesn't look good right now but it will later. That steps into the other comment of own your imperfections. There are reason that there are laws like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. There are reason that the laws around the National Environmental Policy Act. There are reason that there are laws, I'm giving your talk for you, I think, Jane, in a few, a few weeks. Um, the reason that there are best management practices. The forestry sector did things that were very impactful to the environment and changes had to be made. It's a fact. Doesn't mean we're horrible people. It's just a fact. And things evolved and changed. We've evolved and changed. Our practices have evolved and changed. Our knowledge has evolved and changed. Is it so demeaning to admit that? Again, that closing thought and comment of being right versus doing the right thing. Are we gonna hold on so much to being right technically that we miss the ability to move forward? So, probably what everybody's been waiting for. How am I doing on time? I'm good? Okay. Today's challenges. How do we start to take some of the mindset of what I just shared about the Goose Project and really think about how that approaches and how that puts us in a position to try to be successful around a whole host of things. And this is a very short list of what is happening right now when it comes to our forests um, and what it means for us to be successful when we engage around the variety of impacts from climate, population growth, um, large scale investments that we don't have the workforce to implement. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so we think about those things from different perspectives and why, and try to understand why folks have concerns, why they're impacted, why they are not sure how we're gonna approach these things and be successful. So, um, and also that whole piece of conflict for the sake of conflict. So mature and old growth forests, there was an executive order that, that required the US Forest Service and the BLM to do an inventory and a definition of mature and old growth forests. And there were some other things around proposed rulemaking and risks to those forests across the nation. Did anyone see what environmental NGOs thought this meant? A lot of environmental NGOs put out there, we are about to have another protection land designation lines on a map that whatever that the, the assumption was that this definition was going to give us a space to say this is mature and old growth forest and thou shalt not touch it that was put into the ether how did the timber industry respond to that we can't have that we've got to fight this what's going on fear and anger and 
old fights around mature and old growth bubbled up. And now there's a response. And now there's a back and forth. Ironically, there's a back and forth about something that was never said. There's a fight about something that was actually never stated by the administration. We're going to inventory what we have. We're going to figure out a way to best define what mature and old growth forests are to do said inventory, to set the stage for what we will do next. At no, pl at no point do they say, we're going to create a new land designation that separates this from wilderness and monuments and whatever else special designations they have the authority to do. Never happened. But the want and hope of groups that that was what was going to happen pushed them to the point where they put something out there and then they got what they wanted. They got a fight. Which meant that now organizations and people that supported their perspective put them in a place of like, it's time to fundraise because we've got to fight the timber industry that's now fighting us over something that we just said we hoped would happen. And if you look at the list of things up there, the same thing happened with the 30 by 30 initiative. Put up by the administration, we're going to conserve 30 more percent of our lands by 2030 to help protect water and resources. Literally the same thing happened. It actually happened before the mature and old growth um, executive order, but it was the same thing. I got calls and emails from people saying, have you heard what's going to happen with the 30 by 30? I'm like, it's, not, it's an initiative. It's not even an executive order. It's just a want. It's like, we should do a thing, but there's no actual legal action that was taken to do any of the 30 by 30 things that were said. And so now again, we're pulled into a fight that's not even a fight that makes us look like we can't accept change and that we're not willing to align our beliefs around what's most important as a sector, as a profession. Voluntary carbon markets. I don't have enough time to talk about this tonight, but, um, but the thing that I really would like to leave you with as you think about voluntary carbon markets in particular is my new favorite word, additionality. And the fact that additionality is being used to almost completely devalue forest systems as part of carbon markets. The assumption that the only value to carbon markets that someone should pay money for is afforestation. It's only planting new trees. Any type of forest management, any of those things like, oh, well, that's not additional. And the irony to that for me is it's operating under a very odd assumption in my perception. And that is additionality assumes that what motivates people will always motivate people. That what motivates a timber company, I mean, there's a whole dynamic of the shift to Timos and REITs, investors that are looking for value in those forests, highest and best used in value. So you're saying that if we just have a place for forest to do that, that those companies are always gonna do the same thing. That at no point there will be change. Most people don't realize the largest landholder in the US for forest lands, it's not the federal government, it's not the big timber companies, it's small private landowners. They are the largest forest landholder in the country. And are we gonna assume that the same thing motivates the millions of people who own 10 acres, 100 acres, even 1,000 acres, and that they're all independently wealthy and thus only have forest land for altruistic means for the sake of the public good. That's why I have concerns with the, with the term additionality and how it's being used when it comes to our forest landscapes and our working forests as being part of the carbon, the climate solution because it operates on a fallacy, in my humble opinion. That should get some clicks. <laughs> Proforestation. As we talk about this whole dynamic of what, what forests con contribute to the carbon sequestration dynamic, the, the forest is a climate solution, 
Proforestation became a whole conversation. It started in the New England states. And it's the concept for those who aren't overly aware that, that ultimately, if left to grow, trees will sequester more carbon. And this gets back to my favorite little term, being right versus doing the right thing. That is technically a right, a correct statement. But what about people? What about the needs of society? What about wildfires? What about insects and disease? In a utopia, absolutely, forest trees can be left to grow and they will sequester carbon into perpetuity. But do trees live forever? I think most folks in the room know that that's not the truth. So again, how do we have some of these conversations without being defensive? but introducing facts and values in a similar way to, again, to make people think. You get into a fight when you wanna be right, and soon you're just fighting to be right. You don't even know what you're fighting over. But if you're in the conversation for understanding on both sides, then eventually you can say some of these things out loud and folks can't just turn, it, turn off the conversation. You've created a connection such that they're actually starting like, I kind of can't stop myself from listening to what they have to say, because I don't think they're a bad person. And we kind of agree on these like five things. So yeah, I guess I guess I guess I should listen. Obviously, climate enhanced disturbances. This is something that we see now more and more. This is something that the eastern US felt in a unique way this year. I don't know if it made it all the way necessarily down to Durham, but we had the fires in Canada that literally had smoke lay over the entire Eastern coast almost and ruined air quality. So with these disturbances, there's finally more and more of a conversation and an understanding that we can't do what we've always done. And the assumption of preservation may not be something that we can overly push forward and accept to be the only truth. There's a lot of changing perceptions and there have to be, because again, Definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting or hoping for something different. Our forests are facing massive challenges with changing climate patterns, increased weather, more wildfires, more hurricanes. I'm originally from the Panhandle of Florida. I know hurricanes. And I spent my entire, up to 18 years old, I lived in the Panhandle, and I never heard the term rapid intensification before. But every storm at this point, they talk about rapid intensification within a day of landfall. And that is frightening. Something that's not up here that I think um, gives us more and more to think about and consider as we go into this space is, I spoke to her briefly, but the, the um, bipartisan infrastructure legislation and the Inflation Reduction Act funding. Billions of dollars put into our sector, for lack of a better term, to fix it. Fix the fire issue, fix the forest health issue, fix all the issues we have with nature right now. We're just gonna throw money at it. And the lack of understanding that you don't just crank up the forestry engine and all of a sudden things happen. I have personally some very entertaining conversations when folks are like, well, we need to plant, you know, the, the a trillion tree initiative. We're part of some of those conversations. And the part of that conversation is like, we've got to plant all these trees. I'm like, where are they coming from? Your nursery infrastructure almost doesn't exist anymore. So you got issues. So as we look at these dynamics and these things, it's not only the unprecedented moment of interest and investment in our forests and the work that we need to do to try to address those, that, that component of forest health and conservation for the long term. It's how do we maintain it? How do we sustain it? How do we get a workforce to actually do the things that we need done? Because this is that unique space. And if we don't capitalize on this, what does it look like after? So it's exciting and it's overwhelming all at the same time. This particular place that we find ourselves in 
with the interests around climate and forests as part of the climate solution in particular, climate enhanced natural disasters that are impacting a variety of you know, broader and more communities. And what's our role in all this? How do we put ourselves in a place to be safe as well as sustainable? It really is some of the, it really is just a unique quandary and understanding and want to move forward. But again, how do we do that together? We can't do that from opposite, opposite ends of the room, casting stones at each other and being defensive. I'm a long, I'm a long-term believer that there's probably more people in the middle of this conversation than we know, but they're busy trying to live life. So the question is, how do we get them to engage? And I think, again, some of these things that we've started to experience are how they're engaging. All of a sudden, I can't go outside because of air quality on the East Coast. Because it's sadly becoming a bit of a norm on the West Coast. That means that, yes, I'm cooped up in my house, but for some people, I'm cooped up in my house with my kids. And that's, that takes its toll on you after a while because they want to go outside. I have nothing against children, please. Um, but, but the understanding of how things start to affect us personally will, will translate into us being willing to engage in a conversation that maybe we didn't engage in before. So um, SAF as an organization, what are we doing to try to, to help provide solutions in some of these challenging conversations and issues that are coming to the forefront in our sector? One of the main things that we do as an organization because of our broad-based membership is we have the ability to convene. Um, convening conversations um, at a local level, convening conversations at a national level, and, and trying to invite these conversations because at the end of the day, we have to resolve the differences for as much of the differences as we can to get forward momentum. The understanding, the willingness to understand that there has to be a depth of knowledge of policy, a depth of knowledge of practice, a depth of knowledge of values that's gonna help us all be successful and address these issues that are now, have always impacted all of our lives, but they're now signif more significantly impacting our lives and are impacting our lives in very real ways. We share science in a variety of ways through our scientific journals, um, sharing science through our online learning platform. The reality that there's just a space for people to learn, to have access to information, to develop an understanding of what professionals are talking about. Our online learning platform is open to anyone who wants to access content. And that's for a very specific reason, simply being, this is what professional foresters and natural resource professionals are learning, what they're interested in, what they're sharing with each other. And so people can start to get more and more of an understanding of that. Landowners can get a better understanding of what that looks like and be able to speak more intelligently to a consulting forester that they may feel intimidated by. It's just simply because they don't know as much as that person knows. We also have our national position statements. And that's one of the key things we do from a policy engagement standpoint. I don't know the exact number at this point, um, it's over 20, um, but we have these national position statements on a variety of forestry issues or challenges. And the reason for that is to say, as a national association of over 9,000 professionals, this is what's really important to us about this particular topic. And making the shift from those being very in-depth, long documents. We've shifted them to being roughly about four to six pages with pretty extensive literature cited so that people can delve into the research if they choose to. But again, it's that whole thought of how can we make this consumable? So one of the additional changes we've made recently is now those position statements are reviewed and updated roughly every three to five years. One of the things we started doing with our renewals in addition to our, our new position statements is we're doing one page, roughly one to two page briefers. And it's to summarize the issue, it's to make it more palatable. There's some graphics, there's all the things that, there's the things that people wanna read and understand and see that's gonna grab their attention. And we wanna go ahead and create that for folks to be able to, to have, to hand out to anyone. You can hand it out to your librarian, let alone to a politician, but it's something that you can hold in your hand or send as a PDF that someone can get the gist of an issue. Because they, again, I mentioned to some students earlier, I didn't get into forestry to stand up in front of all of you tonight and talk. 
I got into forestry because I like trees more than people and I've been cheated. Um, but, but here I am because it is critical that we have the ability to communicate not only within ourselves, but with, fo with folks that are not of the same perspective as we are and not part of this profession like we are. So I'll wrap up my comments by saying this, trust not facts is the most valuable currency of value-based value disagreements. Let that sink in. How do, you, how do you build trust? How do you be genuine with someone? How do you really put yourself in a place of, it's not about me? Because that's a hard one for a lot of folks, especially when you're passionate about something. Um, at this point, I think I'm ready for q and A. I I will start with, Craig Patterson is a frequent um, I know Craig. You know Craig. Okay, I great. Know. So Craig Patterson is a frequent attendee of our webinars. Craig lives in the McKenzie Bridge area. Yes, he does. And it sounds like Terry has some familiarity with him. Craig is very passionate about the forests and forestry and what's happened out there. Um, he did mention that the goose sail was harvested this last year mostly by helicopter. Now, this has been obviously since, be since after you left. Quite a bit, yes. So... I'm very curious as to if you have any understanding or insight as to why the Forest Service would have um, opted for helicopter logging, mm. given the expense that, as Craig implies, the taxpayers were picking up. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I'm not asking you for, uh, you know, can you go back into your Rolodex of forest plans and tell us all about what you decided to do? Okay. I'm if you could shed a little insight on mm -hmm. decisions like that, mm -hmm. where logging companies would take what some might perceive as an extreme measure to remove logs, and what the philosophy might be behind that. Yes. So um, I'll try to give a little bit of a broader context, but I won't go too deep down this rabbit hole. So um, every national forest has what's referred to as a land and resource management plan. And one of the most important parts of that land and resource management plan are the land designations. So within a national forest, there are different designations given for wilderness. There's def designations given for, um, let's say in the West, riparian reserves. So the ability to protect um, water bodies, be they intermittent or, or certain classes of stream. Um, there's also a, a uh, requirement, for lack of a better term, direction that there is commercial um, timber produced on national forest land. So some, you know, recreations out there, but also commercial timber production. And so, um, so within the Goose Project in particular, the staff that put together that, that project design and layout were looking, for, looking at the areas that were viable for commercial timber production as designated by the forest plan. Um, fun fact that folks don't realize is that the Willamette National Forest is probably about 1.2 million acres. And everyone's like, oh, you're, you're cutting down the entire forest and you don't care and all those very strong sentiments that I mentioned before. The reality is less than 13% of the Willamette National Forest is eligible for commercial timber sale harvest. And that number is actually probably less when you start to take out the little slivers that are left by special designations and protected areas. So to get back to Craig's actual question about why some of the land was actually helicopter logged, it's because it was within that uh, commercial timber sale designation and it was, on, it was gonna be on steep slopes. So the helicopter logging component of it was to avoid building roads and to avoid um, further land degradation by even cable logging systems that may create ruts in the ground and all these other things. And so helicopter log. Now, ultimately that timber company paid for that material and they chose, there was conversations had that basically they ended up at the place of we're going to do a helicopter logging system to remove the wood. So there's lots of opinions on what subsidies look like or don't look like, but I can tell you that the Willamette's one of the few national forests that sells timber sale and actually has dollars come back to the forest to do more projects compared to a lot of forests that have low, lower value materials. So even though it's a helicopter sale, there were still dollars that went back to the forest to do restoration work. 
but but that's how those things are looked at across the landscape and land land designations for different priorities. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a question from here in Durham. The room. Andy. And if you would state your name and <laughs> affiliation, just like we're asking folks online, and you ask the question, then I'm going to repeat it so the folks on Zoom can hear it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And trying to go to Australia. I mean, really, that's, that's what I was trying to do. Yes. Mm. Okay, so Andy is a master's of forestry student on the brink of graduation. <laughs> I'm also going to say she interned here at FHS, so um, and she did an outstanding job. So thank you for that. And thank you for your question, which came down to, I think, in essence, when you're stepping across the tape and engaging with the other side, how do you kind of practice self-preservation in a way? Um, how do you engage and in what ways so that you achieve the, the objectives that you talked about in your, your presentation. Does that sound about right? Okay. No, that's a, that's a really fascinating question. I think, you know, at, at the, I get to get my favorite leadership answer, which is it depends, um, but it depends on you as a person. So I, I will give you my example, but the reality is, is that something that you have to determine for yourself is how you preserve your own energy, how you, where are you going to direct your energy? So if you're in a, for lack of a good term, a bit of a confrontational conversation with someone. Um, at what point do you disengage? At what point do you say, you know what, this isn't this isn't going to go anywhere? And I think, you know, for me, it was very different because this was in a professional setting, and it was. And again, I was a public servant, so technically I could walk away, but at the same time, technically people have access to civil servants. It's a very nuanced lifestyle at times, but. Um, but if someone stays in that place where they want to fight you, at some point you decide personally, like, all right, this this isn't going to go anywhere. And it's not that, and in essence, it may not be that it's not going anywhere. It's just like they just want to fight. <laughs> and so at some point you have to say, well, you know, I, you know, I see that we're, we're, we're not going to agree on this. Thanks for the conversation. And you walk away. Um, and I think that as you look at a variety of ways of what that looks like and how you engage in those conversations, you get a feel for that personally. Like you have that, you have a tipping point. Everybody has a tipping point. Some folks can stay in the ring a long time. Some folks, it's like that first, that first punch to the face, and you're like, nope, I'm out, I'm done. I don't want to do this. Um, so so the, the aspect of it is, it's a great question, but it's a very personal question for each person on how you want to engage in those conversations and what does it take out, out of you. Like I mentioned, part of what helped me was this whole concept of like taking a step back and saying, these people, they, no, none of these folks know me. There's nothing you can call me or say about where I grew up or say anything about what I'm doing that has any real relevance because you've never even met me. And so, like I said, that's, I am by far not an evolved human being, but that's one of those things that you learn and you grow into through your own life experiences. And because of that, I'm like, I can stay in the ring for 12 rounds and just stand there and like, all right, you're upset. That's not my problem. Um, uh, you know, so, so it just depends, but it, it is, it does get back to that piece of being right versus doing the right thing. Because if you're trying to just fight and be right, you're going to wear yourself out really quick. Okay. Uh, we have online an anonymous attendee. Ooh, yes. But, um, it said, can you share your thoughts about conflict as a fundraising device oh my. and or as litigation reimbursement as for funding for NGOs? Now, I will, <laughs> I'll help you out and I'll say that. Um, Do you want to talk about the judgment fund or you want me to? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, I will say that there is this perception mm -hmm. that 
NGOs like a Sierra Club mm-hmm. um, thrived or could do some serious fundraising if certain politicians were in the White House. Mm. Okay, so if mm-hmm. if you are if the person in charge could be a force supervisor, Good could thing. be a president of the yep. United States, not just president or yeah. CEO of an or an NGO like SAF. Um, perception is they're the enemy. Yep. Let's get out the We've got fundraising fight. letters, mm-hmm. ask for money because we got to fight. Yeah. We got to fight this person. We got to fight this decision. We got to fight this action. Yeah. So uh, I I hope I have teed you up. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to comment a little bit you on that. Sure. So um, I think that in and of itself is 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 how um, several organizations in a sense were founded. Like they, they, they were founded around the concept of we have we have a fight. We have to fight for the for our resources. We have to fight for uh, the things that we love, that we're passionate about. And and there are a whole host of nonprofits that are built off, built off the same thing. Like we have a cause. So in the same sense that environmental NGOs have a cause, Sierra Club, um, in this particular place, if you go to Oregon, Oregon Wild, like there's a cause that they are fighting for. Um, and, and so that cause draws people in. That's how they raise dollars for their cause. Um, the Forest History Society has a cause. Um, now, I don't believe the Forest History Society raises money to fight people, um, but but you have a cause that you we, do. We document the fights. There you go. That is what we there do. There you go. You are the. Um, <laughs> we take ever- on all comers in that way. <laughs> You're the ever-present <laughs> observer of of all disagreements. Always the neutral observer. <laughs> but but that's that's part of the dynamic of how do you how does an individual feel like they can stand up to something that's larger than them? So so it's one of those things where it's absolutely a fundraising tactic because. That's the concept. How do you have a larger voice? Um, I won't go down the, the route of the judgment fund and opinions on that, but um, but the reality is, is for those who aren't aware, there is this kind of infamous thing out there that's referred to as the judgment fund. And the judgment fund is basically if the federal government gets sued over an action or an effort and they lose, the judgment fund has to pay out um, the damages, including the the opposition's legal counsel fees so it's quite the thing and it's very old and there's a lot of opinions on the judgment fund obviously i'm sure there's probably some heads like really um but it is real the judgment fund is real trust me i've been sued a few times as a federal employee so so there is a whole dynamic around how someone feels that they can have influence and you're going to have influence as multiple voices versus one would be the way that I would answer that. So it's it's a and it's but it's real on both sides because there are forest industry nonprofits that are funded by industry or others that are pushing for and lobbying for legislation that that supports industry efforts. So both sides really engage in similar kind of work. Any, yes. Mm. So Mike Ezekiel, Micah, sorry, um, from also from Duke. So we have about 20 plus students from the Duke SAF chapter here tonight, and we appreciate that they came out to see their their faithful leader, Terry. <laughs> um, and but Mike asks about when putting when SAF puts out position papers, how that process works. Mm-hmm. Can you? Because these, I've noticed an uptick in position papers yes. since you uh, took the helm in 2018. Yes. Um, so, and I think a little bit of an addition to that, you're also asking about like differing opinions amongst professionals on some of these topics. Um, so the the ultimate tactic of a nonprofit executive, you may get a kick out of this, Tanya, um, is you you pair the message with the right group. So what I mean by that is 
it's a member to member conversation. So when we, when we create national position statements, those are created by a group of volunteers. It's actually probably one of our busy, busiest national committees is the Committee on Forest Policy. And their job is to review and update and renew those national position statements and or um, recommend slash create new national positions on whatever the top topics of the day are. Um, so, but there's absolutely conflict when we when we do those, but part of the part of the process is such that um, there are a lot of check-ins with outreach to a variety of experts. It goes by a board of the board of directors. A, a position statement only goes live once it's been approved by our board of directors. So that's something folks may not be familiar with. Um, but is that piece of having a lot of member engagement. So when there is internal conflict, it's like here's the whole host of folks of your peers that were involved in this process and you know modern solutions. And we'd love to have your input on future position statements. Or you, if you're concerned about the process, you should be on the national policy committee. So that piece of um, folks like to make a lot of noise until you give them a job. Um, sometimes they rise to the occasion, which is awesome because we always need volunteers. But a lot of times when, when someone's really disagreeing with you, like, all right, help me make it better. And, um, and that, that's one of those things that can kind of make someone step back. Um, because again, they're, they're looking to just be angry and have an argument versus actually find solutions. So, um, so you, you look for how you, you find solutions. There are times when we put out a position statement and folks are like, well, that's too broad. You know, what's happening in Michigan is more specific on this issue. I'm like, then write a local position statement. We're meant to cover the entire nation. You can take care of Michigan. So yeah, thanks for the question, Micah. So we're gonna uh, finish the Q&A with an online question. Sure. Um, another anonymous attendee. Um, don't, don't be afraid. I'm not. I, <laughs> anonymous, clearly... is, anonymous is my best friend. I, I <laughs> really enjoy hanging out with anonymous. Uh, this person <clears throat> asks, what are the two, two main ways that we can ensure the healthy future of forests? Mm. Yeah. So this, <laughs> oh boy, um, what are the two main well, ways to uh, ensure the healthy future of forests? Do you have an answer? <laughs> one, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll I'll go for it. I think one is these are tied together. One is um, get helping the public understand the science mm. behind forest management. And, and this is using a broom to hold back the tide, but getting the public to then respect the science mm. behind decisions. Now I wrote, I, in listening to your converse, your pr presentation, mm -hmm. what I was hearing was that this was what you practiced in effect, meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. respectfully listening to them, mm -hmm. speaking respectfully to them, sharing, um, if you will, emotional reactions to, yeah, that clear cut is ugly. However, let me talk to you about the science behind it and where what this will look like in five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we here at the Forest History Society try and do is get information out in a non-advocacy way for people to digest and understand the history of forest management so that they can understand what's going on today to help foresters also mm -hmm. talk to the public. And this is also something that I've seen over my 20 years here is foresters are great. As you said, they love trees, people maybe not so much. And that's, yeah. that, that, that's an that's effort. A challenge. That's a, that's a real challenge. So I'll, I'll okay. give you that one. That's a, that's a good one. I think um, one of the things I would add on to what you said was, was I would say, also figure out a way to, to tie their values to the science is what I would add to the list of things you shared. So, so I think there's, there's definitely that, that whole dynamic of public perception, um, social license, um, relevance that we talk about when it comes to the work that we do. And so I think that absolutely that's a core piece of how we move forward in our, our force being healthy and sustainable into the future. Um, I think that the other way we might go about that is, um, hmm. it's just hard to say. 
there, it's hard to, to narrow it down to two things, but I think, you know, beyond public awareness and knowledge, um, I think that piece of what it means to have long-term investment um, and continued investment in something beyond the initial thing that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. So what I mean by that is this, you know, what I shared earlier about additionality, there's this whole concept of, we just need to plant more trees. Okay, um, then what? You know, a lot of a lot of urban centers are having this whole issue. It's like they're they're putting trees in every random piece of green space, and there's no one to take care of them. And so the dynamic of of understanding that these investments in our forest landscapes for their health, for our community's health that are adjacent and or impacted by forest uh, various forest issues, it is a long term investment. And so I think you you could pair that with the relevance piece and the awareness and the understanding. But that whole understanding that this is a long-term investment, as, as uh, I worked with someone, um, a hydrologist who once said, well, you know, we're, we're out of sexy culvert projects. And I was like, I don't think I've ever heard the term sexy culvert before in my life. <laughs> but the reality is, is at some point, we'll be out of sexy tree, you know, tree planting projects. Then what do we do? Or like I mentioned, the bill and IRA funding, what happens when it runs out? The fire danger doesn't magically go away because the funding stops. So I think one of those really key pieces is understanding that we all have not only a right, but a responsibility to these lands, and that will take long-term investment and engagement to keep those forests healthy if we can ever get to them to a place that we would truly call them healthy. So if I understood, it's we need to invest in people and we need to invest in the land mm -hmm. and get get the people talking about the land. Absolutely. Uh, and it's connected sides. to them. So, Terry, thank you. So um, this is a bit of a special announcement for our illustrious moderator this evening. Um, we recently had our SAF National Convention where we had the opportunity to acknowledge all of our national award winners. Um, I do know there's another couple of other national award winners in the room, so thanks to them. But, uh, but in particular tonight, we had a, an award winner who wasn't able to participate with us, unfortunately, there in Sacramento. And that award winner won the W.D. Hagenstein Communicator Award. This award recognizes an SAF member who leads innovative and exemplary communications initiatives and programs that increase the general public's understanding of forestry and natural resources. Ironically, that's something that we were just talking about as one of the key priorities. And that person who is standing in the room is Mr. James Lewis. So I'm excited and honored. Thank you very much. Sir. to present this well-deserved award for Jamie and all the hard work he does here with the Forest History Society on behalf of our foresters and our professionals. So thank you so much. And the mic is yours. I know you have a couple of comments to share. When the awards uh, nominations were called for last December, uh, Adam called me and said, when I saw the description for the Communicator Award, you were the first person that came to mind. And I was very flattered by that, um, in part because I'm not a forester, I'm a historian. And here I am being honored by foresters, a, a profession that I've spent the last 20 years studying, um, and but not advocating for. So part of the interesting thing about the award is it, it talks about advocating for forestry. I have spent my career instead critiquing forestry. Um, but so I want to thank Adam. I also want to thank Amy Juliana of the National SAF, who lives here in the Triangle area. And she, she and I have, were having a conversation. And I said, I understand, you know, I, I understand there's this award is very significant, but I don't understand the award. Can you translate it into historian for me? And what she said was that this really represents your efforts in public outreach and public education. I'm like, ah, yes, that is what I've been doing for 20 years here. Plus, 
Um, so I want to thank Amy for that. And I believe she also uh, represented me on stage. She stood in for me. And so Amy stood in for Jamie, and I appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank Scott Wallinger, uh, Pat Straka, and Char Miller for their letters of support. Pat and I worked together with others, of course, on organizing the centennial celebration of APSAF in 2021. And we got an extra year together because COVID gave us, it bumped it by a year. And so Pat and her husband, Tom, really uh, were uh, just, they're outstanding supporters of FHS. And Pat was just a delight to work with. Scott Wallinger, a longtime member of FHS. He has served as chair of the board. He and I did the collaborated on the opening presentation for the centennial celebration, which you can find on the APSAF website, in which we discussed, we talked about the 100 years of APSAF's history. And so Scott was instrumental in that. And we, he and I have collaborated on other projects. Char Miller, I've known for 30 years. He has been a, a he is best known to you probably as the biographer of Gifford Pinchot, but to me, he is a, a great friend and mentor. And if for the students, I would say, if you don't have a mentor, please seek one out. They are life-changing as Char was for me. I would not be in this position without him. I would also not be in this job without Steve Anderson, our now former uh, president and CEO. He had the, the foresight. Um, if it, he had the foresight and, and vision to hire a historian for a history society, which sounds like an odd thing to do, but we didn't have one on staff before that happened. So Steve, thank you. Um, I wanna, oh, here at FHS, also wanna thank Eben Lehman, our archivist, because he has, he is absolutely instrumental in a lot of the work I do because of his uh, amazing research skills. He, the, the man is a human ferret. If, if so, he can find things. And there have been many times I've been on the road to give a talk. And I'm like, oh, God, I need this photo. I need this, this citation. And Eben just <laughs> finds it, ships it off to me, no problem. Um, so I wanted to be sure to thank Eben. But uh, most importantly, I wanted to thank, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife, Diane, who cannot be here tonight because of illness. Um, she has been an inspiration to me as well as a role model. She herself is a writer and editor, and I have learned so much in our time together, uh, 26 years together. Um, and she's just really, not only has she been a, a model and, and and very patient with me, but a great sounding board as well. Um, and so, as I said, she could not be here tonight because of illness. I would not be here tonight if it weren't for her love and support over the last 26 years. So Diane, I know you're watching, so thank you. With that, I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. Thank you, Terry, for being here and for the presentation.